he will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sands will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the horns where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And the highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be there for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. From the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the, thro from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. One of the strong determinations at the end of the First World War ended up in the expression, we will remember them. And it's very important to remember constantly that every single human being is unique. It's a, a phenomenon that in the whole of creation, two leaves look the same but they're never identical. Two blades of grass look the same but no two blades of grass are identical. And no two human beings are identical. Every single person has an identity and matters. And it's a phenomenon in the whole of the history of the world, everywhere, that we have names. That we identify people by their names. We remember people by their names. There's no culture, there's never been a culture where people don't have a name. And what we're going to do now in a very important moment is to just remember the names of all those who went to the war that we're, the wars we're particularly thinking of. From World War I, David Bridger, Charles Farran, Robert Ferguson, Frank Morkill, Gilmore Orr, Raymond Pierce, Bede Plant, Gilbert Robertson, Harold Robinson, 
Edmund Brunziman, James Stewart, Martin Williams, Eric Walker, from World War II, Hugh Anson May, Melville Ball, John Butler, George Cadmus, Hilary Coldwood, Peter Campbell, Basil Carlton, Gordon Chesel, Geoffrey Chalchhouse, Noel Cooper, Ronald Coward, Richard Coppercoles, John Crocker, Harold Deck, James Deck, Cyril Finch, Patrick Finch, Michelle Flood, Brian Giddens, Cosme Gong, Douglas Hine, Trevor Hudson Bell, George Hughes, John Ingram, Richard Leva, Owen Lockwood, Gordon Mackinnon, Ian McQueen, Samuel McAllister, Claude McComas, Desmond Morris, Graham Foy, Alex Pearson, John Pinson, Robert Plowright, Gerald Pryor, Reginald Ronald Ranacles, Edward Sr., Harold Spanton, sorry, John M. Stocks, Kenneth Sergi, Ronald Trary, James Watt, Percy Watt, John Welch, Derek Wood, Thomas Wood. Thank you. Please stand. Let's just take a moment's silence to remember and to thank God for those who were prepared to give their lives for freedom and for us. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Please be seated. One of the things that came from World War I was the poppy. And the poppy, of course, reminds us of the fields where many of our brave soldiers lay dead. And so the poppy has become a symbol of what grows new life from people giving their lives. And that's why we have reeds, and that's why we put the reeds to remember those who gave their lives. A moment when I'd like to give you a, a few reflections, um, partly as the headmaster of the school, but partly also as, as a historian. The, the two world wars were, were tremendously bloody. The number of deaths were, were very high indeed. Approximate numbers, and the numbers are very approximate because nobody really knows, but more or less in World War I, 16 million people were killed. In World War II, the number is even higher, 60 million, more or less, including civilians. If you compare this with some other wars, the, the numbers are, are just amazing. Compare, for example, the 16 million of World War I and the 60 million of World War II with the 90,000 of the Chaco War, with the 13,000 of the War of the Pacific between Chile and Peru, or more recently even the Malvinas Falklands War, where approximately 900 people died. The, the scale of World War I and World War II was, was enormous. And here in St. George's, uh, what about the numbers? Well, 
in World War I, 138 members of the Georgian community served in the war. And none of them were killed. We've, we've just heard their names there. Names are on the plaque over there. In other words, about 10% of those who served from St. George's died in World War I. In World War II, the number who served was much bigger. 338 served. 48 were killed. We've just heard their names as well. The 48 are all on the plaque over there. And of these 476 people from our community who went to fight in both wars, most of them had never even left Argentina before, and they'd certainly most of them had never been to Britain before. So I think one of the questions we, we must ask ourselves is, why did they volunteer to fight, and why did they make this very long journey from to Europe to do so? Well, many, of course, came from Anglo-Argentine families. Uh, St. George's, indeed, had, had been set up to to provide an education for British families and for Anglo-Argentine families. So that's an obvious, an obvious reason. But I think the ideas behind those 476 people volunteering to go to fight in both wars, they go much deeper. And I think one of the ways in which we can understand those reasons is by looking, in fact, at the, at the words on on the plaques, it gives us some insights into their thinking and their beliefs. If you look closely at the World War I plaque, the one over here, it tells us that they offered their lives for truth, liberty and justice in the high cause of freedom and honour. I'm sure you all know there's a plaque also in our prep school on the stairs as you go up to the library. And in that plaque it states, the path of duty was the way to glory. And if you look at the plaque which is here, the World War II one, it says, when you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow, we gave our today. These are very powerful words. The values are very clear and I think they, they, they shine even today and tell us what those people really believed. I'd like to give you some glimpses of the effects of the war upon our school community. And I can only give you glimpses because there, there isn't time right now for more. But as I said, we'll be able to understand more in the seminar which follows. I hope most of you know that our school opened in 1898. And when we opened in 1898, we actually started with six students. And this is one of the, the first photographs. I know at the back you can't see it, but this is a, a photograph taken in 1898. And in this photograph, there's actually 10 students, but we started with six. And one of those students is called Frank Morkill. And when World War I started, Frank Morkill was working in Canada and he immediately joined the Canadian forces. He went to France to fight in World War I, and he was killed in the Battle of the Somme in September 1916, and he was 27 years old. So one of our very first students was one of those who served in the war and one of those who died. For World War II, you can read the old Georgian magazines. At that time, they were published twice a year. They, they vividly convey what was happening. In December 1940, we can learn that 80 old Georgians have already left and another 40 will be leaving soon. That's one year into the war. By December 1942, the Georgians telling us that 10 have died, 6 are missing in action, and 4 are prisoners of war. And then two years later, by December 1944, the number of dead had reached 32 and, as you know, was to finish at 48. To conclude, I think I can do no better than
quote from an email I recently received from somebody called Jack Miles. Jack Miles lives in Canada. He's 96 years old. There he is, communicating by email. He studied here in St. George's. He actually began in St. George's in 1926. Think about that. Our chapel was 12 years old in 1926. And he studied here from 1926 to 1935. And then he became a Royal Air Force pilot. And he was fighting in the war from 1941 onwards. In his email, we'd sent him an invitation to come today. And of course, he lives in Canada and it wasn't possible for him to do so. He didn't tell me too much about what it was like fighting in the war. But I think those of you who know anything about the war, you know what being an RAF pilot meant. Uh, you had to be very brave. But what he did tell me was the following, and he said to me, I could, I could quote it today. This is what he said. Any success I have enjoyed in life is in great measure due to the inculcation of ethics, morality, and teachings of my early youth at St. George's, for which I am eternally thankful. I did not realize when I was attending chapel twice each day how very thankful I would feel at 96 years of age for the depth of teaching to which I was exposed in my nine and a half years of attendance at St. George's. Well, I really can't imagine a more fitting tribute to our chapel and that it should come from one of our war veterans on this day is, I think, as they say, the cherry on top of the cake. Thank you. We're now going to hear... uh, second piece of war poetry. This comes not from the start of the war like the first piece. It comes later in the war when the realities of World War I, I think, were becoming more evident. And I'm del- Ignacio is going to read for us. Ignacio. Hello. I'm going to read Dolce de Corum Est, which was written by Wilfred Owen. He was a soldier and also a poet, and he died in service in World War I. And as the Bishop and Mr. Pling said, it talks about the horrors of war. So it goes like this. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Knock need, cutting like hacks we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Men had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshot. All went lame, all blind drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of disappointing shells that drop softly behind. Gas! Gas! Quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim, through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's stick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, of sin as cancer, Bitter as the cut of bile, incurable sores and innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. Thank you very much. I'm going to have another piece of music a more modern song, but one which reflects much of the things we're thinking about.
love will flow when flesh and steel are one. Trying in the coven of the evening sun, tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away. Then something in our minds will always stay. Perhaps this final act was meant To quench a lifetime's argument And nothing comes from violence And nothing ever could For all those born beneath an angry star Lest we forget how fragile we are On and on the way will fall like tears from a star, like tears from a star, on and on the way you'll say how fragile we are, how fragile we the mystery of the way God has made us. We are eternal, we have eternal aspirations which not stop and yet our life is so fragile and God himself shared in that fragility. Jesus gave his life that others might live just as the people we're remembering today were prepared to give their lives. And Jesus faced suffering and hatred and pain and torture and death in the same way. And we're going to pray now and we're going to remember all those that suffered. So let us pray. Remember, Lord, those whose stories were unspoken and untold. Remember, Lord, those whose minds were darkened and disturbed by memories of war. Remember, Lord, those who suffered in silence and those whose bodies were disfigured by injury and pain. Jesus, remember them. 
Father of all, remember your mercy and look with your healing love on all your people, living and departed. On this day we especially ask that you would hold forever all who suffered during the First and Second World Wars, those who returned scarred by warfare, those who waited anxiously at home, and those who returned wounded and disillusioned. Those who mourned and those communities that were diminished and suffered loss. Remember too those who acted with kindly compassion, those who bravely risked their own lives for their comrades, and those who in the aftermath of war worked tirelessly for a more peaceful world. And as you remember them, remember us, O Lord. Grant us peace in our time and a longing for the day when people of every language, race and nation will be brought into the unity of Christ's kingdom. This we ask in the name of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Holy and Blessed Trinity, from all fear and prejudice, bitterness and all hardness of heart, from all spite, revenge and destructive anger, from the desire to dominate others, to impose our will, and from all feelings of superiority. Open our hearts towards our neighbour and help us to work together for the common good. Strengthen us to stand for all that is just and true and right. Grant that we may come to understand our enemies. Bring release to those with abind, abiding memories of hurt and injury. Lord, grant us the grace to receive forgiveness and to forgive as we are forgiven. Comfort all those who mourn the troubled, and all who call upon you in their distress. Guide the, nation, guide the leaders of the nations and those who work for peace and make us all subject to Christ's just and gentle rule. We say together, Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. O Lord, our Maker and our strength, from whose love in Christ we can never be parted, either by death or life, look in mercy on those for whom we pray this day and grant us your protection and peace that we may be saved in body and soul through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now as we ask for deliverance from the forces of destruction, so we pray in the words that Jesus gave us. Praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
call upon the British Ambassador to address us a few words and to unveil the plaque to commemorate the 100 years of our chapel. Ladies and gentlemen, students, uh, headmaster, archbishop, chairman of the school governors, um, I'm grateful, and as an outsider, a non-Georgian, a non-Argentine, for the privilege of participating in this uh, service of commemoration or memorial for those Argentine volunteers who served in the two world wars of the 20th century, and for the privilege of unveiling a plaque, a memorial, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of this chapel and as a tribute to those Argentines who sacrificed their lives in those two world wars. Before conscription was introduced in the course of the Great War, the First World War, thousands of young men in Britain volunteered to fight for king and country. Thousands came also from overseas, from countries far, far away from the fields of Flanders in France and Belgium. Many young men came from Argentina and from this school whose patron is St. George. Why did, the same question as the headmaster asked, asked but a slightly uh, different answer, not that I disagree with what the headmaster said, one never, no, one never disagrees with what headmasters say, uh, particularly if they're your own. Uh, but why did young Argentines cross the, the great distance that separated them from Britain and from Europe to put their lives at risk? At risk for what? For after all, in 1914, when this chapel was built, their government here in Argentina chose to be neutral, as indeed for the greater part of the Second World War did a successor government. And surely there lies a key reflection. Though the government here chose to be neutral, and I'm not seeking to comment on that decision, the young Argentines who boarded the ships that took them far away from their families and friends, took them from the wide expanses of the beautiful land in which they had grown into manhood, and took them to the narrow lines that awaited them in Flanders. Those young men opted not to be, and for that we must always be grateful. And especially should British people today remember the sacrifices those young men were prepared to make. But why were those young men unwilling to be neutral and willing to place their lives at risk? A glance at a map of the world might suggest that battles on another side of the globe were surely wholly remote from the interests and concerns of young people of communities in Argentina. But that is not what those young men thought. They did not think the conflict in Europe was remote from them, because their sentiments were not a product of geography. Their sentiments were a product of felt affinity. Just like the young men who volunteered to travel from other lands, also remote from Europe, from Australia, from Canada, from New Zealand, amongst others. Those Argentines of British origin wanted to demonstrate belonging, their sense of community, their sense of like-mindedness with those youngsters, oftentimes their own relatives, who were rousing themselves in the British Isles to fight for the country that had made them, made them culturally and in so many other ways what they were. It was as basic as that. And let me add, others from other communities in Argentina, having their origins in other European countries, rallied to the same sense of belonging in their own terms, and they too should be acknowledged. But those Argentines of British origin in 1914 and again in 1939 were special in more ways than the obvious ones. And perhaps it takes a British man like me to acknowledge, and to do so with the gratitude it deserves, the particular sacrifice and character of those young men. For those young people were not from a country, formerly or still governing, but from a land and a country Argentina with a different political heritage, but which had made them welcome and which they loved as much as they loved still the country far away from which they had sprung. Those young Argentines who took ship to Britain in its hours of need in 1914 and 1939 were very special people. I want today to acknowledge the sacrifices of those young Argentines and to recognize also the formation of many of them had received at this college 
and from this college many of them went on to die. And I want to do so fulsomely in this 100th anniversary year of the start of the Great War and of the building of this chapel. To remember those who went and didn't return. To remember with thanks those who are here today still and, for whom we owe th and to whom we owe thanks. And the unveiling of this plaque in this chapel today, in large part, a memorial to those Argentines who suffered and those who died in the Great War and in the Second World War, and we thank God for them. to sing our final hymn which we need to remember is about going to war not to kill but to give our lives that others might live so we stand and we sing hymn 70 Onward Christian Soldiers
now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. No, no, no. 